My name is Dr Sarah Jane Burton, um, but you can call me SJ, all my students at Macquarie do. Um, and I'm an English Literary Studies academic, so what that basically means is that I'm someone who studies and teaches English literature for a living. And for fun, actually, as well. Um, my favourite part of the study of English, um, what we would call my key research area, um, is poetry. Uh, I actually specialise in American poetry from the 20th century and at Macquarie we have lots of literary studies academics that um, specialise in lots of different areas. So um, once you get to the level that we're at there are a lot of different options. Um, you get to pursue your passions and you get to really look at the texts that make you excited and connect with you. Uh, so, uh, I just wanted to show you a little bit of what um, we offer our students um, in the English department at Macquarie. So, um, we've got um, a range of subjects, as you can see up on the slide. Um, some of what we work on and teach at Macquarie um, is listed there. Um, and you can see those different interests reflected. Um, it's possible to study Gothic writing one day um, if you're an English student at Macquarie, um, look at creepy texts like Frankenstein or Dracula, um, and then the next day you might enter in one, into one of our children's literature subjects um, and look at picture books or deal with um, you know, uh, graphic novels or your favourite young adult novel. Um, and we look at all of these texts through um, critical lenses and we learn how to um, really look at them um, as scholars um, and as students. Um, so you might even explore how writing and films and TV work together in our literature in the screen course. Um, or you even have the opportunity to practice your own creative writing um, in one of our specialised creative units. So that's just some of what is on offer at um, the Macquarie University English Department. Um, it might be a long way off for some of you, but um, it's always something to look towards. So, um, first of all, as well in my talk today, I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, how I became to um, be interested in one of those areas up on that uh, slide, which is American literature. I um, was about the same age as some of you are now when I started to get into poetry and really love poetry. Um, so, as I said, I grew up in Forbes, a long way from Sydney, um, and I went to a really small high school. As you know, Forbes is not a big high school, the people that are there. Um, and in my year 12 class, I think we had about half of the students that I'm even talking to today. So, um, a, a small school, uh, a long way from the city, um, but um, it, it is possible to kind of take your passions and move them forward into other arenas. Um, so for me, everything kind of changed when I started reading um, a poet um, by the name of Sylvia Plath. I think I was about 14 um, when I found Plath's novels and uh, Plath's novel and poems. Um, so I was in about year eight or year nine. Um, now I'm not going to talk too much about um, Plath as a poet today. Um, other than to say that I did like her so much that I am still working on her um, writing today and researching and publishing um, on her as a poet. Um, so the really important thing about her was that she started me off with really enjoying poetry, okay? So before that, I, I kind of uh, approached it as something a little bit abstract that I didn't really understand. So. Um, when I found her, her writing helped me to start engaging with poetry as a form um, and having fun with it uh, because uh, some of what she wrote seemed like it directly spoke to me. Um, so I tell you that because I think that literature and um, especially poetry has a funny way of doing that. So um, you can often find writers um, who help you sort of um, see the world in a way that uh, connects with the way that you see it. Um, and I again tell you this because I truly believe that there is a poet or a writer out there for every single person. Um, it just means that you might have to read um, very widely before you find your Sylvia Plath. Um, so I encourage you all to read as much as possible. Um, so. A little bit more about who I am. Um, 
my love of poetry and my love of Plath um, led me to many, many, many years of university study. So um, I completed uh, an undergraduate degree and then a master's degree and then a PhD, um, which took a long time, but it was fun. Um, and of course, during that time, I read a lot more poets, a lot more writers, um, and some of them I came to enjoy, some of them um, I despised. Um, and I think it's important to note that even literary studies academics don't just love everything they read, okay? It's, it, it's not a matter of, um, it's a book, I love it. Um, uh, we all have opinions and we all um, have different levels of engagement with what we read. Um, so ultimately I wound up reading and exploring poetry as a job. So what that means is that um, I write down my ideas about poetry and then I publish them in books and articles. Um, and I also teach students uh, like you and the undergraduate and postgraduate students here at Macquarie um, about ways to approach writing. Um, and a large part of what I do is also something called research, literary studies research. So I wanted to mention that because that's kind of one of the, um, the more glamorous and exciting sides of um, of being a scholar. Um, it's taken me all around the world. It's taken me to um, cities that I couldn't have imagined that I would ever go to when I was a student sitting in a classroom in Forbes High. Um, and it's taken me to libraries and to universities and to look at original pieces of writing by um, authors, which we call manuscripts. Um, and as well as lots of other kind of weird and wonderful historical and literary documents. Um, all of which we use to kind of inform our um, readings and our arguments um, about poetry and about other literary texts. Um, so that also meant that um, I was able to go to the actual university that my favourite poet went to, um, Sylvia Plath, um, and uh, actually look at her diaries that she'd kept when she was a teenager, when she was 14, um, and work with those kind of materials. So I got that direct access to um, that author that had sort of seemed like um, somewhere up you know, um, in a world that, that wasn't my own. So um, working hard and studying led me to be able to do that kind of exciting stuff. Um, so this is an important part of what we do in literary studies and I wanted to mention it um, because um, it's called archival research and I, I just wanted you guys to take away from this that, and, and remember that what you love today might actually someday be a job that you can have um, when you're older. So do um, pursue those passions and do pursue those interests that you have because there are always avenues that you can take um, to create careers out of them. Okay, so let's get back to English in a general sense. So what can you actually learn from working with poetry? All right, so um, some of the skills here I've listed on the slide that you can learn. Um, are a, a general understanding and analysis of writing, okay? So writing surrounds us in our world and you can learn a, a better kind of way to approach it by dealing with um, poetry, which is a, an extreme and condensed form um, of writing. Um, when you're working with poetry, you also learn how to argue a point and that doesn't mean that you can have a better fight with your brother and si or sister. It just means that you can um, actually create an idea and then convincingly argue it to um, someone else um, in a written form, in an essay um, or in a response. Um, and all of that becomes very important to you when you do assessments at school. Um, so working with poetry also helps you to think independently, okay? So I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, how poetry requires you um, to use your own brain and your own ideas. Um, so it gives you that skill um, to think um, for yourself um, and not kind of look to everybody else uh, for your ideas. Um, it helps you to write and speak well, um, which is really useful in any career that you go into, um, being able to um, articulate your ideas um, and do that convincingly um, is something that will really help you in your future. Um, and finally, it gives you um, a good kind of uh, 
introduction to how to gather, investigate and assess material, okay? So really in a, in a small, intense sense because for lots of different jobs, uh, you will have to um, gather and assess material, investigate it. Um, but when you're looking at poetry, you've got these little tiny condensed um, versions of information. Um, and if you get really good at breaking them apart and analyse them and analysing them, um, it gives you that skill set that you can then take um, and apply to anything in your schoolwork or in your later career. Okay, so in my um, description of uh, this masterclass, I told you that simple language can convey powerful ideas and it can change the way that you see yourself and the world. So that's a pretty big statement, but hopefully I can convince you a little bit that that's true today. Um, and that's what we're gonna, going to sort of cover as our central material. Um, so first of all, I wanted to read a poem um, that I think illustrates a place that a lot of students actually start at when they approach literature and when they approach poetry in, in particular, because I am not um, unfamiliar with the kind of grimaces and the uh, faces that people usually have when, when a poetry um, session comes into class or um, a, a poem is handed out for analysis. Um, so I'll read, it, read you this poem. It's called Introduction to Poetry by Billy Collins. So I'll put it up on the screen for you. He writes, I ask them to take a poem and hold it up to the light like a colour slide or press an ear against its hive. I say drop a mouse into a poem and watch him probe his way out or walk inside the poem's room and feel the walls for a light switch. I want them to water ski across the surface of a poem, waving at the author's name on the shore. But all they want to do is tie the poem to a chair with a rope and torture a confession out of it. They begin beating it with a hose to find out what it really means. Okay, so it's, it's a quirky poem. It's a funny little poem and you might think, okay, what's he trying to say there? Um, and you might actually have the reaction that Collins is expecting you to have where you say, okay, what does it mean? Um, and Collins uses lots of tricks and techniques um, specific to poetry to portray his ideas to us in this poem. So um, the most important thing that he's saying, though, is that the speaker of the poem, okay, the persona of the poem, um, is a teacher of poetry like me, and he's giving his students in his class um, poems to look at or our poem to look at. Um, and what he wants is for his students to creatively engage with the poems as works of art. Um, he wants them to um, explore and engage with the poem that he gives them. He wants them to listen to it. He wants them to play with it. Um, and he wants them to create meaning from it. But what his students actually want to do and what students usually want to do um, is just take the poem and just understand what it's saying. Just get the answer out of it. Um, and then move on, usually, to something that they enjoy better than poetry. Um, so... What he's describing is probably how most of you would approach poetry, okay? So most of you might have screamed to yourself, but what are they saying? But what does it mean? Um, in frustration when you've read a poem. Um, but treating it like a question and wanting to find the answers is never actually going to work for poetry. You need to take a slightly different approach. Um, so this is, this is kind of um, because we're set up to do a certain type of reading in our everyday life, okay? So when we open emails, when you read the cereal box or the back of your Diet Coke bottle or, you know, you pick up a newspaper, what you're reading for is information, okay? What you're reading for is answers. Um, and that's the way that we understand reading and that's how we practice it on an everyday basis. Um, but poetry as a form is not set up like that. Okay, so you have to take a slightly different approach when you read poetry. So, it's great to ask what it means, um, and we should always ask that question, but we need to actually explore and engage ourselves ourselves in the creation of meaning okay we need to create our own meaning from our reading of the poem and not just tie it to a chair with rope like Colin says and try to get it to confess 
to us what it means. We create meaning through our engagement with poetry. So what I mean by that is that you're not just um, irrelevant when you read a poem, okay? You actually have a lot of power to create the meaning um, that comes out of the poem and that allows you to have fun, that allows you to be creative, um, that allows you to be imaginative um, and it makes it a really enjoyable experience if you approach it in that way. Um, now, this kind of concept might be a little bit hard to grasp at first because, like I said, you're used to just reading for information. Um, so I want to give you a way of looking at poetry that might help you when you approach it, um, both for pleasure, which I hope some of you will do, um, and in your schoolwork, which most of you will have to do. Um, so um, this way of looking um, at poetry is something that I have called the matchbox method. All right, so you have to stick with me here because you might think it's a bit cheesy, but it is a good way to actually think about a poem. So how can we possibly think that a poem is like a matchbox? All right, so it's pretty simple. A poem is kind of like a small condensed version of a text, okay, so any text. So you might have um, a favourite film. You might be really excited about the new Ghostbusters film that's coming out. Or you might have a television program that you watch religiously, like Pretty Little Liars. Or um, there might be a novel or a series like The Hunger Games that you're obsessed with, okay? So these are all kind of bigger, bigger texts um, and texts that we love and texts that we go to. Um, but what a poem is, is actually a condensed version um, of a bigger text like that. So it's kind of like a small little compressed um, version of a bigger text. Um, that's why I've sort of said some matchbox. It's kind of like a pocket sized um, version. You can even think of it as a, a really condensed cardboard YouTube video or a, a tiny little Tumblr feed made out of words if that's what helps you, whatever, whatever works for you um, when you're trying to understand it. Okay. So we have this idea that poetry is a condensed or compressed form of literature, okay, which when you first approach it might seem pretty rigid and boring, okay. So matchbox, look at it, square, boring, not very exciting, everyday object, doesn't do anything for me. If your teacher sat that in front of you and said, okay, study that, you'd be like, great, this is going to be an awesome period. Um, but... Um, while it might seem square and seemingly impenetrable, um, the way that this matchbox method works is that it forces you to look inside, okay? It forces you to look further. It forces you to look deeper. Um, so you have to actually open up the box and find out what is inside. So when we do this kind of practice with a poem, uh, we do something that is called close reading. Okay, so I don't know if any of you have come up with that term in your classes so far, but close reading and textual analysis, okay, that's what we're doing. Um, so when we open up the matchbox, it still matches in there, that's promising, um, we find these tiny little sticks, okay, hopefully you can sort of see tiny little sticks inside a matchbox. If you can't see it exactly, you can imagine um, what they look like. Um, and they're kind of like representational of what we find when we look inside a poem. Okay, so condensed matchbox full of tiny little sticks. Um, and since we only have a, a limited amount of time today, um, I'm only gonna go through uh, a couple of what these sticks could be when we look at poetry, okay? Um, but these sticks are the little things inside that spark ideas and spark meaning, okay? So, um, the matches, so the sticks. So, I'll pull one of them out. All right, there's one. You definitely can't see that, it's way too small. Um, but some of these types of matches um, are things like figurative language, um, tone, uh, visual appearance, spacing, and punctuation, um, context of the poem and its creator, referencing codes outside the text voice, persona, who is speaking, multiple meaning words, um, rhyme and rhythm, genre, plot and events and characters, okay? So a lot of these you may have come across or you will come across um, as you start to study texts in, in higher levels at school. 
Um, so figurative language I'm going to talk about a little bit more as well as rhyme and rhythm. Um, but just to give you a basic idea, um, things like visual appearance are important with poetry because when you look at a poem, you don't just read it, you have to actually look at it with your eyes and see where there's space, okay? So you have to see where there are things that are missing on the page, okay? Um, where are the lines cut off? Because often in a poem, lines are kind of cut off halfway through and you think, why are they doing that? What's the purpose? And there is always a meaning, there is always a purpose to that. Um, things like plot and events, pretty simple. If you've read a book or you've seen a movie, you can figure that out yourself. Um, characters, also sort of a similar thing. Um, and referencing codes outside the text just means to look at uh, stereotypes and things that um, might be expected and how those kind of expectations are playing into what um, is in the texts. Um, so context of the poem and its creator is also um, an interesting way to read poetry um, because you can find a lot out about that poet that wrote that particular poem and see how that is evidenced in the actual text itself. All right, so let's talk about keywords. Keywords is another one that I didn't have on that list, but keywords is probably the most simple uh, one that we can look at. Um, so every text has keywords in it, all right? So if you've got a text in front of you, you can look and you can say, okay, what are the words in this particular poem that um, offer detailed information beyond just the and, um, and, and simple conjunctive words like that, okay? So any kind of word that um, is outside of those normal words. So you can circle them, you can highlight them, you can use all your favorite stationary items to kind of mark it up. Um, and see what um, the, the kind of keywords are in the poem. Um, and in, in poetry, these words are particularly um, important and they can be traced. They can sort of be drawn into patterns to form meaning. And hopefully at the end um, of the session, we'll have a chance to quickly do an activity um, which will outline that. Okay, another match is figurative language, okay? Figurative language is a big one. Figurative language is um, saying something other than what it really is for effect. And pretty much every poem does this, okay? So um, this includes metaphor and simile. Um, so a metaphor is a comparison. A metaphor establishes a new relationship and leaves more to the imagination. It's a shortcut to the meaning. It sets two unlike things side by side and it makes us see the likeness um, between them. Um, and we actually use metaphor and simile in our everyday lives and in our conversations. Um, so they're not too hard to identify um, if you pay attention. Um, so if the language does present the term uh, uh, with an a as or a like, then it becomes a simile, okay? Um, I'm sure most of you guys have probably heard of those before, but just reiterating that for you. Um, other techniques of figurative language include hyperbole, um, personification, imagery, alliteration, and onomatopoeia, which is my favorite because it's just such a great word. Um, so onomatopoeia is basically when you have words that actually um, sound the same um, as uh, they um, are written. So um, wolf, um, oink, all of those kind of animal words are onomatopoeic words. Um, things like clap, um, they all sound the same um, as they actually do when they're actioned in real life. Um, hyperbole just means exaggeration, okay? So um, when your brother or sister comes home and says, you know, I kicked this goal that was just phenomenal and it just, you know, I should be playing for the, you know, the NRL and it's just unbelievable. That's probably hyperbolic, okay? It's probably not entirely realistic of what happened in his footy training session. Um, personification is when we take something that is not a person um, and then we um, apply personal characteristics to it. Um, and alliteration is the repetition of um, the same letters. So um, Sarah sat sadly, um, you know, seeking students um, appeal <laughs> in this particular session. Okay, that would be um, alliteration. Okay, um, 
And imagery is also huge in poetry. It's also building up those images in your mind um, that uh, create meaning. Okay, so another one that's big in rhyme. Um, now, I'll start off by saying poems don't have to rhyme. It's not essential. And a lot of um, contemporary poems don't because they're free verse. Um, but there are some types of rhyme, um, especially in older forms of poetry, um, that are really interesting to trace. So we've got um, end rhymes or perfect rhymes, um, and that's when we have the rhyming of the final words um, of lines in a poem. Then we have slant rhymes, which are sometimes called imperfect, partial, near rhymes or oblique rhymes. Um, and they're rhymes in which two words just share um, a vowel sound, okay? So words like heart and star, you wouldn't think they rhyme, but if you look at the centre of both of those words, they actually do. Um, or um, they can be words in which they just share, share a consonant sound, so they can be milk and walk, um, because you've got that LK and that LK um, in, that, in those two words when they're together. So they're kind of really interesting and creative ways that poets um, put rhyme into their works. Um, finally, I rhymes are actually really cool because I rhymes are um, rhymes that are, look the same, um, but they're actually pronounced differently. So this is when like looking at a poem becomes just as important as reading it, okay? So um, for example, bow and rough, those words look the same when you look at them, but they don't sound the same, okay? But that's still a type of rhyme. It's an I rhyme because it's a rhyme that you can see. All right, so I'm still continuing with my match analogy here. So these are all just little individual sticks, individual matches that are inside this box, okay? So um, hopefully this is starting to help you um, see that there are all these different little types of things that you can find in a poem when you start to unpack it. Um, and you don't actually have to know them all. You don't actually have to, um, you know, be an expert in all of these things. Sometimes just being able to identify one or two um, will make a really insightful um, response when um, you're doing your work for school um, or when you're just enjoying poetry. Okay, so after close reading. Now, after close reading, um, there's an important step that we can't forget. So you do this close reading and you find all these sticks and you find all these um, kind of ideas and you trace them all in the poem. Um, and then you think, okay, well, that's good. I've done that. So now what do I do with all of that? Um, so what you have to do is you have to ask the question, so what? Okay, so if you're looking at the tiny little stick that is tone, which is different to this one can be rhyme, this one can be tone. Um, then, um, and you've said the tone is sad, okay? When you read that poem, you think that really, it sounds sad, the tone that's being used is sad. Um, then you ask, so what? So what does that mean? Okay, what does that mean in the context of the poem? What does that mean for me as a reader? What does that mean for um, the audience, the context in which the poem was created? Um, you can say the poet uses intense ocean imagery. The poem might be full of descriptions of dolphins and waves and all of these beautiful kind of scenes of the ocean and you might think, wow, I've just been to Jarvis Bay, but you've actually just read a poem that's, you know, intensely um, overusing ocean imagery. Um, but anyway, you have to ask the same question, so what, okay? So what, what does that mean? Um, then if you look at rhyme and you say the composer rhymes cat and hat, now so what? Okay, and what I'm emphasising here by saying to you ask that so what question um, is that this is how you form an argument, okay? And I, went, I said before about um, looking at poetry makes you um, more astute with creating arguments. Um, and no, again, it's not fighting. It's just... Um, articulating and putting forth your opinion, okay? So it's a written argument. It might be a speech that you do in class or it might be an essay or it might be a short response, um, but it is an argument. So you're doing all that hard work by looking through the matchbox and finding all these different little matches and, and kind of noting all that down for yourself. Um, and then you are forming, a, forming an argument by saying, so what? 
So you need to write another sentence after that, um, that statement that you might make about that thing that you found in the poem um, and say, so what, why does it matter? And that's actually called um, exposition or expository writing. But we won't get into that today because if you all come and study with me at Macquarie, I'll tell you all about that. Um, okay, so just a quick thing about how to do the matchbox method. Look and consider a poem is like a matchbox, look inside, okay? Think, take a look inside, check for different sticks. Um, write something down um, that might be um, related to the poem in relation to those little sticks and ask yourself, so what? And start to build a response to the poem yourself. Okay, um, now I kind of wanted to finish this with my kind of big reveal of why the matches are important. Um, and hopefully I don't set off any smart uh, fire alarms when I do this. Um, but basically the thing about matches is that each of these little sticks are an idea. Each of these little sticks are a tiny little part, a tiny little fragment of um, the poem itself. Um, but each of them has the ability to, am I going to be able to do it? Okay, light a flame, okay, create a flame and spark something. And that one little tiny flame can actually create or ignite a fire that is bigger, okay? And that's how these ideas and these meanings become something huge in your life, okay? They might change your life. They might change your studies. Um, they might just make you think about the world in a different way. But every single one of those little matches in that little tiny condensed matchbox um, is relevant um, and will help you in your life. So thanks guys, I hope that helps you. Reading lots of poetry made me um, start to open my mind about um, different perspectives and different ways of life and different ways of living all around the world because you get a lot of different ideas and perspectives in poems and because they are so condensed and they're so intense, when you start to analyse them, you learn a lot. Um, I've learned a lot of really random facts and information because I've been trying to, to critique words um, and actually look deeper into them. So that's, that's made me, that's expanded my knowledge base. Um, and then to take that into public speaking, um, it makes you a lot more confident because you, um, you know that you know a lot more about the world. And I haven't done any study in mathematics or science or history or archaeology or anything like that, but my study of poetry has crossed all of those um, interdisciplinary areas um, and given me a great knowledge that um, I think I use every day. Depends on the poem, <laughs> is the quick um, answer to that. Um, I think that all of the matches are equally important. Um, and depending on your reading um, uh, and depending on the meaning that you're drawing from um, a poem, um, it can depend. Um, I say to my students in my classes, um, Here's the poem that we're reading and, you know, it might be about seemingly about something, but I can say to them, look, if you want to argue that it's about elephants walking down the street in the Sydney CBD and you can back that up, um, you can give me evidence of that through looking at these, what I call matches, looking at these kind of technical components, um, then I'm happy with that. You know, I'll give you a HD, I'll give you good marks because if you can argue that and use the textual evidence, um, that's the great thing about poetry. It is so open to interpretation. Um, so I wouldn't think that um, figurative language or rhyme has, you know, um, more or less weighting. It just depends on your reading and, and the way that you're extracting meaning. Personal choice. Um, I, I'm a bit of a fan of the rhyme. I like it, but I actually like it um, when it's a little bit more interesting and a little bit more creative and it, and it asks a little bit more of you. Okay. So when I was speaking before about um, I rhymes and those ones that are kind of hidden within the words, like personally, I find those really cool because 
I think, you know, it, it might not immediately be there, but then it actually subliminally is when you start to analyse it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, look, rhyme has, and rhythm as well, um, is a component in most poems, even if it's not traditional rhyme schemes like I was talking about. Just sound and the way things sound together um, is a form um, of rhythm. Um, and that's always in poems and that's kind of a, that's a, a, you know, a great, a great component that, yeah, makes it really interesting and pleasurable to read, I think. Ah, well, I mentioned Sylvia Plath. Um, obviously I have a couple of favourites of hers. I love a poem of hers called Elm. Um, and I love another poem of hers called Mira. That's one of my favourite um, Sylvia Plath poems up there, um, which is about a mirror and it's about a woman kind of bending over a mirror and looking at her own reflection and kind of reflecting on her own identity. Um, I really like that one. I love Emily Dickinson. Um, I'd say a lot of you would probably approach Emily Dickinson at some time in your studies um, because she's very good at making things even more and more condensed um, than a lot of other poets. Um, and I have a lot of other favourite poems from... They're actually most of them are from the 1950s in America because that's the, the main area that I've worked in. Um, but, yeah, there's, there's a lot out there and, like I said... Um, if you kind of read around and you don't have to read deeply, you can skim, um, you'll find somebody that, that kind of just gives you a line or gives you a paragraph or, you know, a stanza that, that will connect with you and that will mean something to you and then that, that'll open up a whole, whole new kind of area of reading for you. Okay, um, we actually just had our last class um, on Monday for feminism and literature um, and um, it was a very successful unit here. Um, we did um, several weeks on poetry and one of them was actually on Sylvia Plath, one of them was on another poet that um, I researched called Anne Sexton um, and for them um, they were writing about uh, their position as women um, in society in the 1950s, in the mid-20th century. So if any of you have ever watched like Mad Men or anything like that, you'll know that there was this kind of whole world of, you know, domesticity and the domestic and like being the perfect housewife and all that sort of stuff. Um, so a lot of those kind of issues were um, articulated in the poetry that were, was written by women at that time. Um, and also any, any kind of women's writing that's, that's dealing with women's experience is feminist um, because it is looking at um, the female perspective um, which historically has actually been oppressed. So um, I guess that's how it fits with feminism. There's a lot of stuff there. It's very exciting. <laughs> have to I think um, I don't think you can avoid it um, I think it's actually really important for you to read other poetry than the stuff that you're given at school um, I don't want to be too controversial there but um, if you want to expand your interests and you want to get a better understanding of poetry and when you get to year um, year 12 you'll have to find extra texts for yourself as well um, so poetry can help with that um, but yeah, so I, I, I think that, that poetry outside of school is just as important because I never studied Sylvia Plath at Forbes High School at all, ever. Um, so <laughs> she was just somebody that I found when I went to um, the library in Forbes that is still there and has, you know, Forbes Literary Institute written on the top of it very grandly. Um, and I used to just go there in the afternoon and wander around and have a little bit of a look at books and pull out things that, that looked cool to me. And that's how I found um, Plath and started reading her. So um, it might sound nerdy, but it's not a, a, an unpleasant way to spend an afternoon and you never know what that will do for you um, for your future because you might find a book on sharks and become a marine biologist or, you know, um, find something else that is of interest. I 
think Robert Frost is a great poet, um, especially if you're new to poetry and you want to um, look at somebody who's got a great um, body of work. Um, obviously, I've mentioned Sylvia Plath. Um, they're um, contemporary poets. Um, there's a really great contemporary Caribbean poet named John Agard, who we teach in our first, um, first year um, poetry course that students really love. Um, uh, I'm a big fan of a, an early 20th century female poet called Dorothy Parker, who is really, really funny, um, if you like funny poets. Um, I could sit here for another 35 minutes and tell you um, a lot of different, different people. But um, also, you know, the romantic poets are great. So if you look at Keats or Shelley or Byron, um, any, any of those guys will kind of rock your world. Um, <laughs> So just go to the library, look at the poetry section, skip through and, and just see what, um, you know, what works for you because um, it's going to be different for everybody. Um, you know, what works for me is not going to work for everybody else. You know, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's an ancient Japanese form called haiku um, which I'm not a huge fan of because it's very, very tiny. It's like, it's, it's often like two lines. Um, and for me, that's not enough because I love taking it apart. I love, you know, pulling all the matches out of the box. So when you've just got two lines, I sort of think, oh, what am I going to do with this? You know, like, how am I going to, going to work with this and create, um, so much meaning? I mean, some people are very, very good at it, but for me, I'm not, um, not a huge fan of that kind of really small um, type of poetry. Definitely, absolutely, most definitely. Um, poetry, like any other art form, you know, um, is an expression of ideas. Um, and there are kind of national positions for poets. For instance, in the, um, in the United States um, and in the UK, they have a poet laureate. So that's somebody that is a poet that sits on, um, in an office in, um, in the government um, and advises on um, kind of affairs to do with arts and, and life. Um, and I think that, that that in a kind of political sense is really powerful. Um, and also I think it just sets a light bulb off in people's minds if they read it. And it, like I said before, it builds your perceptions of the world and it makes you a better person because you start to see that not everybody sees the world the way that you do. Um, and that I think can change the world if you know, people understand each other um, and their individualities and their differences and diversity. Um, and poetry is a good way into that. Um, because sometimes it's quite a personal um, form. And just one final tip for your studies, if you are studying poetry, something that I have always done and that I teach all my students to do is to take a poem and take a piece of paper and a pen and actually write that poem out by hand yourself. Okay, so don't just read it, like obviously you have to read it, but don't just read it, actually write it out and pay attention to where the full stops are, where the spaces are, what the words are, and it'll actually kind of give you that experience of producing um, the form, which will really help you slow down um, and read the poem and start to extract the meaning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.